I somehow lost the ability to write with my pen on the screen. So I take good notes today because I'm going to have to write some stuff on the board. Um, so last time we talked about overpressure. Who remembers what overpressure is? What the definition of overpressure is? It's a it's a pore pressure that exce exceeds what? The normal hy hydrostatic pressure. And what what is the um, normal hydrostatic pressure in numbers? 0.44 per foot. PSI per foot. So we're going to talk today about the mechanisms or some of the reasons that this might occur. And the most common one uh, would be something called disequilibrium compaction. So I plan to draw you a pretty picture. Um, again, I'll have to draw here. Can, can every, you know, those of you on this side of the room, can you see here? Okay. So uh, just like I said there in words, the ongoing sedimentation increases overburden. So the vertical stress faster than fluid diffuses out of the zone. So if you have some highly permeable layer that fluid can move through easily, say, say for instance, sand. Okay, so fluid is, you know, <coughs> this is a relatively well-connected uh, location, so fluid can move around in it quite easily. And then due to sedimentation, that's occurring over the top of it, you begin to get a cementitious layer above it that's laid down over time, but it's laid down faster so the rate of sedimentation occurs faster then the fluid can diffuse out of it. So if this is some sedimentation that, say, causes some cementitious layer that eventually over time, when I say time, I'm talking geologic time, so long time, right? This happens faster than the fluid can diffuse out of it, which will then cause this uh, lo location to become overpressurized, okay? because you're laying sedimentation on top, which is increasing the vertical stress, and that increase in vertical stress is occurring faster than the fluid can get away to equilibrate the pore pressure. And this is a scenario for overpressure. Um, so the time at which this occurs, the characteristic time at which this occurs uh, is given in Zobac. So right now we're in chapter two of Zobac, if you want to read along. Uh, the time at which this occurs, uh, the characteristic time tau, Zobac lists this formula. And again, I don't know why that doesn't show, that that's a fraction. I don't know why the line is not there. but. He lists, like a lot of things in that book, he lists the formula, but he doesn't tell you where it came from. Okay. So who knows uh, kind of the, the characteristic law that we use to govern or model flow in a porous media? Darcy's law, right? OK. So and then we plug Darcy's law into something that's basically the continuity equation or conservation of mass. And then we get this characteristic equation that we solve for uh, fluid flow in a porous medium. So that equation is like the density times the compressibility uh, times the time rate of change of pressure is equal to, and, and this is fully in 3D, so you have to use some vector calculus, but uh, this times the Darcy velocity uh, 
times it, so the divergence of this guy, which is the flux, which is the Darcy velocity, uh, well, I'm sorry. It's just the Darcy velocity, the divergence of the Darcy velocity. And then we, for the Darcy velocity, we have um, that it's a function of the pressure gradient. Right? So in that case, we have um, Darcy permeability over the viscosity. And, and I usually use the symbol uh, mu, nu, that's nu, right? For some reason, Zoback used eta. So I'll use eta. OK. Uh, times the pressure gradient. So in three dimensions, it's like that. OK. Um, let's just think about this in 1D. And we can move this uh, compressibility over if we want. So if we move it over, well, let's, let's not do that for right now. So let's just write down um, if I write this down in 1D, it looks like this. Right? We don't have a gradient operator. It's just the, the partial derivative of pressure with respect to x. It's a fluid viscosity, yeah. I, normally, you would use mu there, but nu. But for some reason, uh, Zoback used eta. So we'll, we'll just use that guy. OK. So you know, velocity is some length over time, right? Meter per second, OK? So if we replace this or equate it with some characteristic length L over some characteristic time. So this is basically, characteristic means just we, we have some, some length that we're interested in, and we want to know how long, what the time is it takes for fluid to fuse over that length. So that length could be, say, the thickness of a, res of a reservoir layer. Okay, thickness of a formation, for example. We want to know how long it takes for fluid to fuse out of it. So in this case, back to our little picture, um, some formation that's highly permeable and then has some sedimentation on top of it. And maybe this is our characteristic link. I don't know how long it takes fluid to diffuse out of that. OK? So uh, this, this equation right here, we can approximate this partial derivative by just using finite differences. So we'll say that k eta is the change in pressure over change in length, change in x. Okay? And since our change in length that we're interested in, our delta x that we're interested in, is this thickness, it's L. Okay? So then we'll equate this, and, and I'm going to rewrite it down here. L tau equals k eta L. Right? And then we just solve this guy for tau. So we have 1 over delta p eta l squared eta over k l squared. All right? So let's let's do a little k, eta over k, yeah. Let me rewrite it clearly. OK, so this is our equation. Now let's take a little aside. Let's go back to uh, 
Solid Mechanics 101. If I have a little piece of material that has an original length um, LO, and I push on it, apply a force to it such that it changes, and this is just one dimension, so it only changes in this direction, so that the length changes to L, then I can write down an equation for strain, right? What's, what's strain? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry here. Again, I apologize for the, I would planned to write this on the screen. Original length L, I apply a force, I change it to LO. What's the equation for strain? Yeah, or, you know, depending on how you define positive or negative. But typically, we, we talk about positive in compression uh, in, in geomechanics because mo most of the Earth is in compression. So, You'd have something like this, right? And so that's our that's the definition of strain. And if we can measure the stress that this undergoes, and we plot, say, a curve that's stress versus strain, and the it typically looks like this, right? Well, what's the slope of this guy called? It's the Young's modulus, right? E. All right, so then we have an equation. This is a linear const constitutive equation. So a constitutive equation that relates stress to strain, okay? Okay, so this is just in, in one dimension, applying a uniaxial force to deforming it in one direction, okay? So imagine the same thing. But now in three in three dimensions we have a we have a cube. Can you guys see that over there? Okay. So we have a cube now. Okay, and we're gonna apply a stress on all faces. That's equal. Okay. And that's going to deform the cube equally. Okay. So I, I just take this little cube and I squeeze it, and it deforms. Now remember, in in three dimensions, stress is a tensor, strain is a tensor, so the the true constitutive relation would be also a tensor. But in this case, there's no, I'm not applying any shear strains, okay? So the stress, and it's equal in all directions, is, the, you know, is just, you know, the, the full stress tensor would look like this, right? And so something we call the hydrostatic stress, stress hydrostatic is then the, the average of the diagonal, right? So it's one-third three sigma, which is equal to sigma, right? And something we call the, the volumetric strain is, so if, if I apply a, a strain in all directions, then I have you know, the same thing, if I were to measure this strain, then I'd basically have the same relationship. So I'd have some volumetric strain that's one-third sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma yz, I'm sorry, zz. And these are all the same. This is all we care about, okay? 
And so it turns out, I mean, this is a scalar value now. So I've re reduced my tensor equation down because everything else is zeros. Now I just have a scalar equation. Yeah. You can't see it too, the writing's too small? Okay. So we have that sigma hydrostatic is equal to one third the trace of the stress tensor. This is all zeros, right? And so in this case, it's just three sigma. And then same thing for the strain. The, the hydrostatic, or another word for these are volumetric. So I'm just squeezing, I'm taking this cube and I'm just squeezing it equally, okay? And so I also have a hydrostatic strain that's something like that. So it would be this guy. And if I strain it equally in all directions, then it, you get the same relationship. But, but all we really care about is we're, we're just interested in these scalar values. What's the relationship between the hydrostatic stress and the hydrostatic strain? <coughs> Well, it turns out it's, it's, it's very similar to this. I'm just going to replace sigma by sigma h and epsilon by epsilon h, OK? And it, it's also going to have a linear relationship. And does anybody know what we call that? It's not the Young's modulus now, because now we're talking about volumetric measures. The bulk modulus, right? The bulk modulus. So that slope is the bulk modulus, OK? So let's imagine a scenario where my change in stress, my change in stress is delta p, and my change in strain, my change in volumetric stress is delta p. My change in volumetric strain is 1. Right? And we know that equals to the bulk modulus, right? So, so this is the, the you know, slope is rise over run. So I have an equation delta p over 1 is equal to k. Or k is equal to 1 over delta p, right? So this was all just an, an aside to go back and look at this equation. <coughs> to go back and look at this equation and see that, is it a problem? What? I, 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 wrote it, I wrote it backwards. Right. Sorry. I just So uh, if we if we take this equation and we plug numbers into it that are representative of say a low permeability sand, which the low permeability sand has a, a Darcy permeability K somewhere around a millidarcy, and then we just plug in a representative numbers for porosity and compressibility um, and fluid viscosity, then and then we solve for the and we, well we also have to plug in a uh, characteristic link. So in this case we'll say we'll just choose one. We'll say that you know there's some seal or some layer of sedimentation that's one tenth of a kilometer thick. For low permeability sand, if that sedimentation is low permeability sand, then tau would be on the order of years. So it would take a few years for the fluid to diffuse out of that, which is a pretty short time scale in geologic terms, right? 
few a few years is not very long in terms of geologic time scales. So after a few years, all the fluid would diffuse out, and then you would have an equilibrium state, and you wouldn't have an overpressure scenario. Right? However, if the seal is a low permeability shale, which has an, a uh, Darcy permeability of like 10 nano Darcy, then now you have a characteristic time for the same length, a tenth of a kilometer, for the same length you have a characteristic time that's on the order of 100,000 of 100,000 years. So now this is mean this is becoming more meaningful. I mean that's that's longer than humans as we know them, Homo sapiens have been been around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so you're right. In in this term, in this here, you would normally have a, instead of p, you'd have a phi, and you'd have a, a gravity term there associated with it. Yeah. So, but just this is we're talking about terms on the order of hundred thousand years to get an estimate of the characteristic time. Uh, it it would make it would change the answer a little bit, but it would be small in, in terms of that. The 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 uh, porosity and permeability actually affect the answer a lot more than any small effect of gravity in, in this term. Yeah. So it would be a little bit different. It just makes the uh, good good uh, question, but it just makes the derivation a little simpler if you leave out the static head due to gravity. So this is actually this um, uh, this equilibrium compaction is actually very common in the Gulf of Mexico. And does anyone know why? So this is um, this is this. This here is what they call gamma ray log, which uh, is a way to account for, so any of these sort of large kicks to the left, which again, I'm sorry, I can't get a, um, are layers of sedimentation and sand, of changes in sand, and what, then what you see, so this is actually a, a rig off the coast of Louisiana, or a well that was drilled off the coast of Louisiana, and you know wh what we're really looking at here is the pressure, and then you see, it f this is the hydrostatic line. Again, I'm sorry I can't draw very well with my finger. But there's a hydrostatic line, and then you see the pore pressure change as with depth. So up to, up to some depth, roughly right there, um, 1,500 meters, it's hydrostatic. And then below that, you get into an overpressure state. Okay? And this is very common in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's one of the reasons that the Gulf of Mexico is quite productive, because we can tap into those overpressures for production. Um, anybody know why? why? Why is the Gulf of Mexico significant? Exactly. The Mississippi River. So the, the sedimentation over hundreds of thousands of years uh, flowing in and, and cementing, uh, then it's create this overpressure state in, in the Gulf of Mexico. 